everyone, and welcome to the show. So, like I mentioned in the intro, we have a longtime friend of mine, a uh, person that I've, you know, spent a lot of time with all over the world, and also been able to watch and be a part of his business growing, uh, Chris Wren. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. So, Chris, there's so much we could talk about with Bridge Nine, with Sully's, with all of the things that you've done with your career, especially what you're doing right now with uh, setting up your your new location and actually like owning the building. And we'll get into it. But before we touch on any of that, in the end, this is a podcast about leadership and people come from all sorts of walks of life here. We have people who are uh, in the corporate world, we have people who are musicians, we have artists, we have activists, all sorts of people come and listen to this podcast, but they all come for one reason. And it's about hearing about leadership from people like you from different walks of life. So if you think about leadership, how do you apply that? Or what does that mean for you in your life, both personally and professionally? You know, I never set out to be a leader when I started my Bridge Nine and then later Sully's. Um, so it's sometimes it's tough for me to answer because you kind of get forced into a situation where you have to kind of the prize the occasion. Um, I think being a leader is about uh, learning how to surround yourself with people to help you accomplish your goals and finding the best people and, and helping them, you know, help you, I guess, to, to get from point A to point B. You know, for me, it's tough because people might look to me as, as a leader. I mean, you're interviewing me for your podcast about leadership and Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't ever something that I set out to be. In fact, I don't always consider myself the best leader. You know, I just, Mm -hmm. I just, uh, do the best that I can under the conditions that I, that I have. It's been real interesting knowing you for all this time and and seeing how you've grown your business. And then I, I think in some ways, I kind of shrunk part of your business while growing another part of your business. Like there's been a lot of decisions you've had to make or accommodate as things have changed. And I want to get into that. But one of the things I want to hit on uh, right up front is you've been running a a record label for 25 years and then you've been running Sully's for a long time. If you were to think of all the lessons you've learned, what's the biggest one that you could say that you've learned? Every really good opportunity that I've had for either brand has uh, been because of the relationships that I have and that I've, I've kind of nurtured over the years. Um, but also having to act fast and and make that decision and, and run with it. Some of the the greatest opportunities that both brands had have been because of quick thinking and, and, but also leaning on people that, that, you know, have, uh, I've worked with over the years and, and come to, to know and respect. So for those who aren't familiar with Sully's or Bridge Nine, can you give us just a little bit of history of each one, how they started and where they're at today? Sure. So Bridge Nine was my first brand. It's a record company that was started in 1995. Um, We started by putting out records with, you know, uh, friends, bands, and have over the years accumulated over 300 titles in our catalog. So, you know, we went from just a handful of seven inch records with punk bands to um, albums for some of the, the best known hardcore punk bands, you know, out there worldwide. Through my needing to uh, invest in that brand, I started Sully's because I was living in Boston. I was, you know, I don't know, five minute, 10 minute walk from Fenway Park. And I was, looking for an opportunity to earn money there and direct it into the, into the, um, the record company. And that we've been doing that for 21 years now. Mm -hmm. So both brands have coexisted, uh, side by side in in the office ever since. All right. The interesting thing about both uh, brands, bridge nine and Sully's is they really just started as kind of like a street based kind of DIY thing. And I want to push on this because you've turned them both into real businesses, but they were like, kind of just like a bunch of kids just trying to make money in the beginning and not bridge nine, but Sully's was definitely just a bunch of kids hustling on the streets, trying to make money. And bridge nine was more of a passion project. That wasn't a money thing, but it is kind of have like a a cult, like a youth culture uh, beginning. So I want to start with bridge nine. You're in Connecticut, you're in college. You're, and is that correct? Is that where you started Bridge Nine? So I, I was in high school in Connecticut okay. and my, my family was living there and I was going to college in Vermont. So I was during the school year, I was in Vermont and summers I was back in Connecticut. 
All right, so you just want to be a part of the scene, as most of us do, right? We kind of find our space in the punk scene, you know, record label, photographer, zine, you know, musician, whatever it is. Most people kind of find some way that they interact. For you, it was putting out a, a, out a record. But as soon as you do that, you're taking a leadership position. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like you said, I was looking to connect. You know, I was I had moved three hours away from my hometown scene and the act of releasing a record was my way of staying connected to my friends from my hometown, from the scene that I had come out of. Mm -hmm. There was a scene in Vermont, but I was new to it and I didn't really know it very well yet. And I was still kind of finding it. But at the time, uh, putting the record out was something that connected me to um, what I had known coming up through high school. What's interesting though, is like, there's that, and this is so prevalent in punk and hardcore, it's that like, you didn't have any background in putting up music before that. You just decided to do this and you're going to figure it out, right? Oh, yeah. And I, I had no business doing it. But it, I mean, <laughs> nobody did, right? Like right. In, in most of these instances, I mean, you look at somebody that's established and people mm -hmm. look at, uh, I mean, that's the number one lesson that people need to know. When you look at somebody that's doing something, you think they've got to figure it out. They know exactly what they're doing, whether it's a business owner or a parent. And the reality is you don't, you're winging it and you're learning and you're figuring things out. So for me, I was, you know, a teenager and wanted to do something. Thankfully, there had been other people that had done it before. So there, you know, I wasn't reinventing something. I was able to, to kind of ask around and, and start something even at that age. And, you know, you just, you just try it and see what happens. I mean, I, I didn't have a business plan. I didn't have any real, um, you know, big plans to, to create what I have created over the years. It was just, let's see if we can do this, this one time. Totally, man. And I love what you said there. Cause like that idea of like, you know, even, whatever company, whatever it is, like whatever huge conglomeration, like big company, it started somewhere. And maybe the form it's in now isn't the same. It's like, it's not, maybe it's not the same name as it was when it first started, or like it certainly probably wouldn't have the same people or families involved, but everything starts somewhere. And very often things like the biggest thing starts somewhere. And very often it starts with someone who's like, eh, I don't quite know how to do this, but meh, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to make something happen. Like someone who invents something, like puts out a record, comes up with a, with a design, like engineers something. It's someone who's just trying something and then seeing what happens next. Well, they say that no idea is original and that whatever you're thinking of, there's five other people that have the exact same idea somewhere. And it's just a matter of who actually acts on it yeah. and who does it. So if you have a great idea, it's not unique. I mean, nothing is unique at this point. Somebody else is thinking about solving whatever problem it is that you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of doing it. Which is going to bring us over to Sully's because with Sully's, you were just a bunch of kids making Yankee Yankees suck shirts and screen printing them yourself. Was that it? Or were you getting someone to screen print them? Um, yeah, no, it, we, it was a mix of screen printing ourselves and, and, and having other people help us. Um, you know, at the time, I mean, I grew up a Red Sox fan. I'm from, I'm in central Connecticut, but I'm on the Red Sox side of Connecticut. You know, the, the state's kind of split down the middle between Boston and New York. It doesn't have its own identity in a lot of ways, but I was a Red Sox fan. And when I moved to Boston, uh, by that point, I was a skateboarder. I was in the hardcore and punk rock. I didn't really have any place for organized sports. I had abandoned it growing up, but you know, you still have a soft spot for that. So you know, when you, when we first started going down to Fenway Park, um, I mean, you have 38,000 people in one place, mm -hmm. 81 days a year mm -hmm. during this, you know, during the six months of warm weather that you have in Boston. And, and that's a huge opportunity. So what motivated us wasn't sports passion. It was just, Hey, there's dollar signs leaving that, that stadium. Let's try and get as many of them as we can. You know, there was a handful of us doing it. Mm -hmm. Some of them, you know, spent the money on 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 trips and drugs and 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 partying. Um, I focused all that money into putting out records. Right. So, like, but this is an interesting story because it was illegal what you guys were doing. You were just like printing shirts and hawking them on the streets. Like, it wasn't like you had like a license. You were just setting up, setting up shop on like a corner and, and selling shirts, right? Yeah. There was there was basically what we were doing to the letter of the law was not allowed. Um, mm -hmm. There were some loopholes and we were able to exist in a few of them here and there. What we tried to do, and we, we didn't, we didn't make Red Sox shirts. You know, 
we made shirts that resonated with Red Sox fans. Yeah. So, you know, we weren't necessarily stepping on trademarks. We weren't selling counterfeits. We were creating something that wasn't available in the pro shop. You know, if you're an angry Red Sox fan, now keep in mind in the context, <laughs> this was, this started in 2000. Totally. Red Sox had, had last won a world series in 1918. Yeah. So there, there was <laughs> most people in their lifetime had never seen the Red Sox go all the way. And I mean, the closest they had, they had come prior to that was, I think in 86. And then I mean, that's you know, 14 years earlier. So People were angry and, and and what we were doing, you know, it's funny. I learned this year uh, what we were doing wasn't unique. You know, in, in the, s- the summer of 2000, when we're out there hawking Yankee suck merch, I thought that we were doing something that was edgy and that was, um, you know, like, like kind of new. Mm-hmm. And you'd hear every once in a while from somebody like, oh, I remember seeing Yankee suck shirts back in the day. And, you know, I, there was no evidence of it. Uh, just this past summer, I, I, I connected with uh, two people, one, uh, two women actually, that were selling Yankee hater T-shirts in 1978 on the same bridge I was selling at. One of them's a grandmother now. It's the what? cool. It's it's so funny. So like you know, fast forward. I mean, they were doing it in '78. We started doing it in 2000. So fast forward 22 years. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, their whatever they had sold was long gone and and, and out of circulation. Um, Red Sox fans were just hungry and angry. So we offered them something, you know, that they couldn't find elsewhere. Here's the interesting thing. And it goes back to something uh, interesting to me. And it goes back to something you said earlier. So other people were already doing this. So I know you talked about the people in the seventies doing it, but you're, it was people that you knew were already doing this and you came in and started doing it with them. Is that right? So the, um, there was some guys in the summer of 1999 that were selling t-shirts that said Yankees suck on them. Um, I don't, I didn't really know them. They were just, I think college kids, they, Mm -hmm. they uh, had a card table and um, the t-shirts that they had, there, like these Navy blue shirts. And it said 21 on the back for Roger Clemens who had Mm -hmm. left the Red Sox and was now on the Yankees. And it said Yankees suck. Um, And we called them the 21ers and they, they were running the show down there. There was no competition. You know, they were selling them for 20 bucks a pop or something. And at the time, a buddy came to me about selling T-shirts. He had seen them. He worked inside of the stadium doing concessions and wanted to make a T-shirt that was simpler. So uh, he basically uh, came up with a a version that was based on the Boiling Point fanzine, uh, hardcore punk fanzine logo that was the City Yankee suck on the front because um, the other shirt that was the only other shirt that was available said Boston on the front. So if you're, let's say, an Orioles fan and you're coming to Fenway to see the Orioles play the Red Sox and you hate the Yankees too, you don't want to buy that shirt that's already out there because it says Boston. You're not a Boston fan. So uh, he was the one that kind of came up with a simpler version that we all kind of ran with uh, with other merchandise. I, you know, I was offering stickers and flags and, and things like that. And shout out to Boiling Point. Uh Tim, you rule. I'm super psyched uh, on all the legacy of Boiling Point. So thank you for all your continuing great design. All right, man. This is killer, though, because like we've got the 21ers and you got this group of guys that you're doing it with. But you turned it into an actual business. And it goes back to what you said earlier. It's like, hey, whatever idea you have, it's been done before. A lot of people have done it. But it's the person who's willing to really do it. They're the ones who go on to be able to like kind of like develop something that has a legacy and last and you can build on. So tell us about like moving it from just something you were doing on the corner to actually Sully's becoming a real thing. Yeah. So, you know, a couple of the guys that I was working alongside of with, you know, selling this kind of rivalry fueling apparel and merchandise, they really weren't interested in anything outside of the quick cash on the street. Right. They were just trying to hustle to people leaving the game. And then that's where it ended for me you know, I already had a relationship with some of the local stores like Newberry Comics. It's a really popular pop culture and music mm-hmm. store in, in New England. So I said, let's get these shirts into to Newberry Comics. Let's get them online. Let's let's build off of that. Mm-hmm. Um, for a couple of years, it was really just focused on hating the Yankees because that's that, that was the identity of the Red Sox for fans mm-hmm. for so many years, um, kind of being in their shadow. 
and uh, and hating them for it. So, um, you know, we we as the brand and as what we were as what I was doing started to change a little bit, started to focus more on um, believe in Boston was a big early trademark for us. It was mm-hmm. kind of focusing on the positive on the, you know within the community as opposed to the negative uh, that we're fighting against. Mm-hmm. Um, things started to change, and it, it, that's when the brand of Sully started to develop. When you actually started turning it into a brand and the people who weren't, I don't want to say big thinking, because like I know some of those people have gone on to do some like pretty cool things. They weren't thinking big about Sully's. But when you started to be like, no, like I'm going to make this a thing. Was there any bad blood with the people who were like, well, hey, like this was kind of our thing and now you're making it your thing? Like was as there was like a clear split and you started to run with it, what was the reaction from from your peers? It was, I mean, it was over, it was pretty much pretty positive. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I butted heads with, with one person in that original old crew, mm-hmm. um, but that's what happens. And I would butt heads 10 times out of 10 again. You know, if, if you have a, an idea of how you can build something, mm-hmm. you have to sometimes just take the ball and run with it. And that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of what happened at that point. Yeah, man. But let's hit on that. Cause that's super important. So for example, I run a, like a coaching and training company and like a, <laughs> We're not the only coaching and training company. They've been around forever and they're going to be around forever. Some are great. Some suck. Some are in between. And my take on things are pretty unique, I believe, based on my background and you know psychology and, and punk and all of that kind of stuff. But really, like we're talking about people who just have the willingness to do it. And there is always beef. I mean, there's beef in my industry. There's going to be beef in your industry and your willingness to kind of like knock heads with people is, is something that's always stood out to me because you're clearly a guy who's been successful, but you've had people kind of like come at you about it, but you've always held your ground. So why is that important when you're taking something that was just this like an idea and then actually turning into something that has like legs? Like, why is that important to be able to like stand your ground like that? You know, you don't want to have your story to be defined by other people. Mm. And for me, it was a matter of, you know, seeing where I wanted to go and, um, and just doing what I had to do to, to, to accomplish those goals. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, I was when I started selling the Yankee suck stuff. Initially, I had been approached by the, the guy that came up with the bowling point concept. Since I wasn't much of a gambler, he was really into poker. Uh, he ended up partnering with my roommate. So they kind of took that ball and ran with it. And I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. I'm, I st- I'm still doing this. Um, so I started making little things, stickers, enable pins, patches, st- stuff like that. And there was nobody, they didn't care, you know, uh, because it wasn't a t-shirt. And so we were like, all right, well, I'm going to do these things. You guys do those things. They pulled together a crew of a handful of people. I pulled together a crew of roommates, other roommates, um, you know, people in bands that I worked with and started selling this stuff. And we realized we had strength in numbers. There was 15 of us down there. So the 21ers weren't going to say shit. They were not going to say anything. They were like, you know, uh, they would come up to us and, and try and assert themselves. But, you know, there was a pretty clear difference that between the two camps. Um, so we were not going anywhere. Um, after a couple of years, the 21ers resolve kind of ended. Mm -hmm. So they, they left and that created uh, an opportunity because now all of a sudden there used to be two camps. There was a 21ers and then there was collectively us. And when the 21ers left, um, I wanted to fill that void. Mm -hmm. So I had kind of had a gentleman's agreement that I wasn't going to get into the shirt game for three years, you know, uh, prior to that. And then when they left, I said, you know what, Uh, I'm making shirts. Um, so that, that put me at odds with that, that one person that was in the mix, Mm -hmm. everybody else. I mean, the, the, the crews that we had built up shared roommates and it shared band members and people that were selling t-shirts for him were in bands that I was putting on records for. So there was, there was no beef, but there was, uh, there was a little bit of a, you know, bad blood between him and I, but again, I mean, you know, I can't let him dictate where I'm going. And totally. for me, I saw an opportunity after three years of seeing the potential. And when those those competitors left, mm-hmm. uh, stepping into their place to kind of be able to grow um, 
because at that point, you know, I was doing really well with what I was selling, but there is a ceiling to the opportunity and I would bring in a new vendor and they would crush it. And after a little while, see that they could get more opportunity with other guys. So they would move on and I'd lose a, a good vendor. So I basically had to, uh, to change up a little bit so that I could keep these people and, and I could allow what I was doing to grow. Yeah, man. And also like, and I think this is an important message for everyone. Anyone can criticize. Anyone can be like, oh, you did me dirty or you're not doing it right. Or, you know, this was my thing or whatever it is. A lot of people can complain and criticize, but very few people can build and grow. And like that person who's criticizing, if you're like, oh, okay, you know what? Fair game. Like, you know, okay, I'll just leave it to you. Doesn't mean they would have built what you built. Like it takes a kind of mindset and a kind of willingness to really put yourself all in to actually build something. So uh, RJ from Timeless and I were talking about it a few podcasts before where it's like a lot of people can complain about how you run a business or what you do about it, but giving the same opportunity, could they actually grow a business? Could they actually have done a better job than you? Anyone can complain. It doesn't mean they can build, grow, and do a great job themselves. Yeah, I agree 100%. We've got Sully's, it's starting to develop, but really initially a lot of it was just like money to survive, kind of hustling. And also to funnel money back into Bridge Nine. So Bridge Nine just starts like kind of like for fun. You're you know be part of the scene, be connected to to the the scene that you came up in. But it starts taking a turn at the American Nightmare Seven Inch. Yes. Yeah, so the American Nightmare Seven Inch came out five years after starting the label, and it was my seventh release. So I was only putting out one record a year. And it started with people that I knew personally that were, you know, I went to high school with. And then the next couple of records were people that I met because I was going to Boston a lot and they were giving me demo tapes at the merch table that I was selling from. And, you know, fast forward to 1999, going into 2000, I was living with a couple of members of American Nightmare. Um, they were not a thing yet. You know, I offered to put out their seven inch just because they were my roommates and I was the guy putting out seven inches and I liked the, you know, the bands that they were affiliated with prior to American Nightmare. So mm -hmm. it was just like, yeah, let's do it. We'll put out a record. And that period of time, that's kind of spring of 2000 was, uh, I mean, it was uh, what's the, is, a, you know, uh, electricity in a bottle. Is that, is that the, the phrase? Lightning, like, I mean, lightning in a bottle. Light, light, yeah. Lightning in a bottle. I mean, it was you know, everything converged at the same time. We had, um, I had a label that was willing to do stuff, not much yet. You know, I'd only put out one record, I think earlier that year. Um, I had uh, a band, American Nightmare was like, all right, let's, let's, we're going to do, we want to tour. Uh, Tim had only toured a little bit with 10 yard fight. So he was itching to get out there. Um, you know, I know Wes really wanted to tour. So, Basically, I just needed to come up with the money to, to fund it. And that's right when the, the, the money outside of Fenway Park kind of started. And you're right. It, for, for us, it, it was just about going, selling whatever we could, bringing it you know, at home. I'd have a backpack full of cash. I'd dump it on the bed. I'd go through it and make you know bundles. And then the next morning, I would go to the post office and buy money orders for you know, pressing plants or I'd, 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 order, I'd pay, you know, for the recording session of a band. Um, and it was just kind of at, on an as needed basis. Mm -hmm. It was several years before Sully's became its own company mm -hmm. and kind of funded and, and the money stayed within that its own brand. Yeah. But for the first three or four years, every dollar just went right from Red Sox fans to making punk rock records. This is another thing because it's like lightning in a bottle, right time, right place, right band. Uh, American Nightmare, you know, I'd put out a demo at that point. And like, I guess like dude, they were doing okay. But when that seven inch came out, the world changed. I think we can both agree American Nightmare being one of the most important bands uh, in the history of hardcore, certainly. Um, and when that seven inch came out, it was, you know, right at the kind of close of that youth crewy kind of chapter and starting a whole new thing. And they really did create the, like a, a bit of a, I don't know, movement's the right word, but they did kind of create a style um, about them that was impacted hardcore for many years to come still to this day. But let's hit on this for a minute, because again, you could be right time, right place, right opportunity, wrong person. You know, like a lot of people could have put out that seven inch and been lazy about and did a shitty job, but you ran with it and you pushed it. 
I mean, there was a lot of record labels back then run by people like me living in Mission Hill apartments or, or you know, just living in an apartment with a bunch of guys and your records are underneath your bed, yeah. you know, and you don't take out that ad mm-hmm. or you don't fill the mail order. I mean, it, there, there are so many elements that could have been missing and would have hurt the, the momentum. It was just about, you know, having whatever resources were needed for the band at that time. You know, that was our first time that we did full color posters. Yeah. You know, that was the first time we we did, I think, full color printing of the, the, the layout. You know, I mean, there was expenses that that record incurred that that I hadn't done before, but I knew this record needed. Man, that and that record was deluxe everything, like everything about it. I just remember holding it in my hands and just being first it was impossible to get because it was like selling out like crazy. But then like holding it and just being like, this is a beautiful record front to back. But like going back to that idea, like getting all in behind that, not leaving those records behind your bed, like. If you're thinking about people and, and and when people are starting things, you know, that kind of like that song you always hear where people are like, oh, I didn't get the right chance. The sob story, you know, I didn't get the right chance. I didn't do this or I didn't do that. One of the questions I always, I always think of is, well, did you get that? But you didn't go all in. Like, did you play small? Did you push yourself? Because really early on, Sully's, like you pushed yourself, man. You took risks. You took leaps. Bridge nine, you pushed yourself. When, when the moment came with American Nightmare, you went all in. Is that something that's just natural to you? Or was that like, oh no, this is the moment and I need to do this? I think I grew up as a risk taker. You know, mm-hmm. I know my parents would definitely agree, and probably any school official I ever worked, you know, <laughs> oversaw me. You know, I was always a risk taker. Um, and but you have to recognize those opportunities when they come because mm-hmm. there are plenty of opportunities that have presented themselves to me that I didn't act on, mm-hmm. either because I didn't have the, the bandwidth to deal with it or some other part was missing. So I think a lot of times it's, it's less about not getting the opportunity and you're right. It's more about seeing it and, and running with it. Can we tell the story about how you got the money for the American nightmare seven inch? <laughs> the, uh, the parking lot fight. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was in, in bed, uh, with a, a woman I had just started dating. Uh-huh. Uh, it was late at night. So we you know, it was just, it was, I had my cell phone, my first cell phone, um, started ringing and a friend called and said, Hey, what are you doing? And I said, I, I you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this and like, well, we've got 500 bucks and we want to see a fist fight. It's like, what? <laughs> so basically this was a month into the Yankee suck thing happening. So, you know, people, all my friends had disposable income. I mean, everyone had hundreds of dollars sitting in their pocket that they didn't have, you know, six months earlier. So, they were thinking outside of the box. So like, oh, we're bored. Let's see a fight. So they pooled their money together. And I think the guy that called me had originally agreed to fight and then backed out of it. So he, he was basically uh, tasked with finding somebody to take his place. So um, I, I was like, yeah, all right, I'll be there. So I um, I, I, I told my the, the woman I was, I was dating, I said, you know, I, I have to go to this parking lot to, to, to fight this, this guy. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds ridiculous now, but, um, you know, and, and, and this was like I don't know, 11, 11 o'clock mid, midnight or something. And the person you're fighting was a friend of yours, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was a friend. <laughs> it, it, I mean, somebody that I knew, you know, this, there, it wasn't something that was like, um, bad blood or, you know, and it wasn't even, it wasn't even like a necessarily a fair fight, but it was, it was, you know, getting out of bed. And I mean, I could have easily been like, dude, go find somebody else. And then just stayed in bed. But I, um, I walked down to their house and it was funny cause I walked up to, uh, into their apartment and there was like 20 dudes, you know, all in the house and we're up high-fiving each other and, you know, all excited. Um, now a little context, like I, I had been in a handful of fights, you know, and even that spring probably around Fenway park, but like, I, I wasn't a fighter. I right. wasn't like, it was usually like, oh shit, something's happening. We got to deal right. with it. Right. Um, you know, I think the last time I had gone to fight somebody was in like sixth or seventh grade, you know, <laughs> like, like, so like, it, it, you know, I wasn't taking jujitsu. It was just like, all right, it's mm-hmm. look at 500 bucks. All right, let's do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we walked down to this parking lot from, from their house a couple blocks away and uh, just, you know, bare knuckle, like, kind of like uh t- i don't know two two minute fight um you know 500 bucks winner takes all 
And uh, wait, the loser didn't get anything. No, no, no. I mean, ah. well, so, so I mean, spoiler alert. Uh, I I did win, mm-hmm. and uh, thankfully, and I I gave I gave the guy I fought a hundred bucks um, because he was a good guy. And he, I mean, he, like I, I he was I probably was six inches taller than. Him. It was. It wasn't good enough, man. He was good, but not good enough. But like, wait. So you got the money for the American Nightmare seven inch because the Boston hardcore scene at the time created an unsanctioned bare fist boxing match that you won to get the money. And it was paid for with, you know, Yankee sucks dollars. This is like chef's kiss to this, to the story. You know, you look back 21 years later and it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it, it's, I mean, it, it, only that, I mean, you, you, that couldn't happen now. I don't think that could happen now. Course, I feel like it was not. very specific to the time and place. Um, but it was funny because I, you know, I, I, uh, I was given like a wad of cash, you know, I gave a hundred bucks to, to the dude I fought. And then, Mm -hmm. um, they all went back to wherever they were going into their house. And and I walked back to my, at the time, my girlfriend's place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, she was like, she was nervous. She was like, (laughs) dude, just (laughs) this guy that I've I've been dating for two months, just left to go fight somebody. Um, and it it sounds ridiculous. Um, but I, I, I walked in and, uh, and I had, you know, $400 $400 and I, I just threw it on the bed. It was like such a baller move. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, it, and I think she, we ended up going into the kitchen and she got a bag of like frozen peas for my hand, you know, cause it was swelling. Whew. I, you know, I could go on, we could do a podcast just about the story. Uh, but all right, man. So there was a lot of like mystique around uh, bridge nine and uh, you know, what was then kind of proto Sully's, um, by the time I met you and you, I'd known you, Reputationally, I'd obviously known about Bridge Nine. I'd known about all the Yankee Suck stuff. And then over the years, I watched you scale up Bridge Nine and scale up uh, Sully's, which kind of scaled up after Bridge Nine. Because when I met you, Bridge Nine was kind of your main thing. But at some point, Sully's became more of your main focus where Bridge Nine's fell into the background. So tell us about that. So Bridge Nine has had, I think, one thing that's kind of helped uh, separate Bridge Nine from other labels mm-hmm. is. A, I had this opportunity to create income um, outside of Bridge Nine that uh, it felt like a money tree. You know, it was just like, oh, I, I need to deal with this issue. All right, I'm going to go do this and, and earn money. So I never had like to sell, de- sell it, sell it. Yeah, sell it. So I, I never had to um, treat Bridge Nine uh, financially the same way a lot of other labels did. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have to answer to anybody else. Um, you know, I, I didn't have to live on it. I didn't have to depend on it for my income because you know, I had this other entity that was uh, paying my rent, paying, you know, my living expenses. I probably, it wasn't always, you know, to my benefit. I mean, I was probably spending money uh, almost erratically, you know, because I didn't really have to answer for it. Um, but it allowed me to, to, to grow Bridge Nine very quickly. I mean, I was going from one record a year for, for several years to in 2001, on the heels of America Nightmares growth, um, I think a lot of bands saw that I was, you know, everything that I was doing for them and they wanted that too. So I was able to sign any band I wanted to at that moment and went from, I think three records, including the American Nightmare record in 2000 to I believe 11 in 2001 12 in 2002, like 13 in 2003. So like it's, it, it ramped up very quickly and mm-hmm. went from just putting out bands that were from new England and the Boston area to, you know, signing bands from the West coast, you know, and then later signing bands from Europe and Australia and like all these other places that I ended up traveling with bands. You said something to me during that time, uh, that I, it's always stuck with me. And I reference fairly frequently when I asked you, like, Hey man, you know, why are you putting so much effort in Sully's? It was when I noticed you were starting to put a big push there and you said, um, I don't want bridge nine to be where I make my, like where I make my salary from, because when your passion becomes, uh, when your passion becomes your paycheck, you have to start making choices based on your paycheck rather than what you like. And you have to make choices based on what's what you know will sell versus what you think is just cool and you want to exist. And I always thought about that. I was like, ah, oh, it's a really cool way of looking at it because think how many labels and how, how many artists kind of have that story, like musicians or artists where it's like when I started making money is when I started having problems with like my creativity because I needed to 
now this thing had become how I make money and I needed to keep that going. But it kept me it kept me from being more focused on what I knew would sell rather than what I wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty much how I have always kind of handled bridge nine. Um, you know, when I can, I do draw salary from it, but it's, it's sporadic. And I've always depended more on Sully's as kind of my livelihood. Um, and the, what allowed me to cr- continue to create and build with bridge nine. Well, it's funny. Cause like you got a band like Metallica, who's so big that they can afford to put out a record like Lulu, which is like flaming pile of garbage. And you know, like they can be a super indulgent and sell like Metallica, I think sold like, I don't know, like 75,000 copies of something like, like some unimaginably low amount for Metallica to sell of a record. And it's, it's a record that's that bad that they can afford to do that where it's like, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, artists, a lot of musicians, a lot of record labels, they're like, you're one or two failures away from being bankrupt. So like you can't really afford to do that. You have to focus on what sells. For me, this might just be perception on my end, but it seems like at one point you became, you started to get more fulfilled or enjoy doing Sully's more than you enjoyed doing Bridge Nine. Is that correct? It, it is correct. Yeah, I, I think for me, Sully started happening after I was kind of burning myself out, putting a lot of records out, and it was just a new challenge. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a new opportunity to do something a little bit different. Um, I think in a lot of ways, both Bridge Nine and Sully's, uh, there's a lot of similar aspects to what they are as brands, mm-hmm. but it allowed me to exist in different circles and to try different things. So it was just a a fun challenge. Yeah. Well, also it's like, I think knowing you, I think you also enjoyed making t-shirts that are like a little bit controversial, like not in a negative way, but like, I think you kind of like giving people the elbow a little bit and like putting things out there that give people a lot of joy, but are a little bit like, Oh, (laughs) I can't believe that. A lot of the stuff that we made back then hasn't (laughs) aged well. Um, Mm -hmm. But the reality was you were dealing with really angry uh, bitter fans and um, you needed to get them to laugh and stop yeah. in order to make a sale. So, mm-hmm. you know, as people, cause again, it, be- this is before we really existed online. Yeah. I mean, in many ways we're victims of our own success because uh, the t-shirt game on the street, which still mm-hmm. exists on some level, isn't as good as it ever was because there's no immediate need to act, you know, mm-hmm. like, Somebody can walk by and be like, oh, I'll just order up my phone. You know, that mm-hmm. that didn't exist back then. So people had to kind of, you had to get their attention and have them stop. Yeah. Well, it's interesting though, because with Sully's, you've gone on to develop relationships with like actually the athletes and with like famous people like Ben Affleck and like with actually like the Red Sox to a certain degree. So like, tell us about how that happened. It's funny. Literally, as we were setting up this podcast, I just got a text from the clubhouse manager of the Red Sox asking me to create a t-shirt for one of the players that mm-hmm. they want like Monday. Yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm, outside of this, I'm trying to make that happen. Um, you know, again, it, it's just um, it, seeing an opportunity and running with it. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I started working with the Red Sox through some charitable organizations, first with the Jimmy Fund, which is a big um, uh, uh, charity related around fighting cancer. So mm-hmm. we started working with them for a few years and then, I worked with the Red Sox Foundation um, and helped them raise money through a couple of initiatives. So, you know, you as you work with these organizations, you meet people and and there's a mutual respect. And it's funny because in a lot of ways, what we did 20 years ago, um, we we ended up leaving an impression over the years on people that went into uh, positions of leadership themselves. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I, one, one charity that I work with, the woman who was in charge of all corporate sponsorships pulled me aside and said, Hey, like, I just want to let you know that I bought this highly offensive t-shirt from you when I was in college and I still have it and I, I don't fit it. Um, I can't wear it, but I'm never getting rid of it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when I, when we first sold her a t-shirt 20 years ago, she was, you know, just uh, probably a sophomore in college walking to, you know, to the game. Uh-huh. And now she's in a, 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 a very high position of leadership mm-hmm. and and likes us and uh-huh. wants to see us succeed. And, 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 and it's an opportunity. I mean, when we started, nobody in that world wanted anything to do with us. You know, we were just the, the guys selling offensive T-shirts, you know, running around the stadium, selling them out of backpacks. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we've grown 
as a, as a brand um, and and when opportunities to give back have presented themselves and we've been able to do that, um, you know, we've been able to develop relationships that have, have given us access to, to some of these opportunities. Well, and I, I this relates to something that I, I like to talk to people a lot about um, when I work with them as a coach, which is be undeniable. You know, like if you're doing something and you're trying to create a change or you have an idea or you you just want something to be, you, you think you can reform things in a new way, the old guard's going to push back. You know, the norm doesn't want change and they're going to insult you. They're going to criticize you. They're going to act like you're, you know, kind of like beyond contempt. They're going to look down their nose at you. When you become undeniable, it's when what you're doing is so interesting. It's so cool. It is really a game changer that the people who were trying to stop you before embrace you afterwards. And that's what happened with Sully's. You became undeniable. And that's what happened with American Nightmare. Mm-hmm. You know, Absolutely. When, when they first started, uh, they were challenging the status quo mm-hmm. a little bit in the, locally. And I remember, I mean, there was people that were like kind of gatekeepers in Boston at the time that didn't want to see them succeed mm-hmm. and tried to, you know, pull the carpet out a little bit initially mm-hmm. and couldn't couldn't do it. I mean, they were a force mm-hmm. and they just broke down the door. And mm-hmm. later of those people, you know, hopped on the bandwagon and 100 you know, percent. Yeah, for I mean, for for us, like with with Sully's, um, you know, I, it was a matter of just like so. Here's a, can I tell you a story about yeah, yeah. how we first started working with some of the charities. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always tried to give something back to the Jimmy Fund. They mm-hmm. were like they are like the charity uh, that's most closely connected to Fenway Park and the Red Sox. So you know, we saw our what we were doing as as we were we we're taking something and, and we had this opportunity, so we try to give back. And even if it was, you know, thousand bucks here or something like there, when they would have their, their uh, fundraiser every summer, they'd have like their telethon. So I was able to collaborate with somebody to make a t-shirt and, and it was kind of around one of the players, but it wasn't really official and it definitely wasn't tied in with the, the Jimmy fund. Um, but we raised $5,000. So I said, that's a lot of money. Let's make a big check. And so we, made like one of those ceremonial big checks and then drove down to Fenway park during the, um, the telethon and the security guard at Fenway park was like, that's a big check. Come on in. So like we weren't invited. (laughs) We just walked right in and, uh, and we were, we were just kind of hanging out watching the telethon and, and we were waiting. We ended up actually uh, getting a photo with one of the players holding the check. And it was, it was, it was a very cool opportunity, but somebody from the Jimmy fund was like, Hey, who are you guys? And we're like, Oh, we're like Sully's. And we raised this money. She's like, yeah, tell me about this. So I told her, she's like, that's, you you can't just do that. Cause when you have a big charity like that, you need, you know, you have to be a sponsor to Mm. to solicit money and to what have you. Mm. So we're like, Oh, okay. So she's like, yeah, here's my card. Let's talk. We ended up becoming a, a formal sponsor for several years and and ended up having a great relationship and, and, and people that I worked with over, over that period of time, I'm still collaborating with now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes you just have to make that big ceremonial check and just show up. Uh, I love it. All right. Let's talk, let's go back to bridge nine though. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of things that might be a bit sensitive. So you, you tell me where you want to go with it. Um, it's undeniable. Like bridge nine starts like any small DIY label. It's just some small thing you're doing from your bedroom but then it becomes a focal point and you literally could have signed any band you wanted at that time. Bridge nine was the label and was the label for like a long time. And, you know, I'd say like you and death wish basically were like the, the two main labels. Um, but then it changed. So let's say in a post have heart world and have heart being, I, I think the most popular hardcore band of all time. I think like, I think they're the biggest hardcore band of all time. I, there's probably a lot of people that would argue otherwise, but they, I mean, look, when they had almost what, like 9,000 people show up on a parking lot for their reunion show, that's, that's pretty sick. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. I, so I think everyone, you know, they're kind of like the people's band. I think everyone was like, ah, oh, that's so, that it's heartwarming to see. But so, you know, like let's say in a post have heart world, bridge nine has declined, uh, in really being like a spotlight label and has kind of gone into the background. You still label, but like, you're not really an active label. And I'd say for like the youth, you're not really their label for, I'd say for at least a couple generations of hardcore kids, if maybe 
maybe three to four hardcore kids, the generations of, of hardcore kids, you were their label. But now it's just a label where let's say like a triple B is, is like a kind of like a current, like the current label of, of the moment. Was that intentional or did that just kind of happen? I, it, so it's, it's the life cycle of, of a band or a label. Those mm-hmm. they're very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, triple B, uh, is crushing it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're not always going to crush it just like I, you know, crushed it for a while. Triple B is bridge nine. Mm-hmm. And I, that I, when I was to like revelation or equal vision, totally, totally. so, you know, the labels that were crushing it before me, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, you, you've got like this life cycle. So, mm-hmm. um, it's very difficult to, to do it for any extended amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that we've done it for as long as we have, you know, I, I I'm very proud of, um, but you, there's, so many variables that that go into that um you know the biggest one is um your immediate connection to the the artists and of course when i started the label and i was the guy in the van and i was going on tour um i had my ear to the ground and i had the most to prove so i was willing to take a lot of crazy risks you know early on uh which i think is true for a lot of people when they're at that spot, you know, over the course of a decade or, you know, or longer, you know, for me, um, you know, I, I got married, I had a child, I got divorced, you know, like there's these, uh, things that happen in in your life that are outside of just being the guy in the band. So, you know, I went from going to every show to only going on, you know, once in a week, you know, once, once a month. Um, and so, at one point I, it wasn't me finding the bands. It was the guy do a mail order for me or the people that were in my bands, you know, that were, you know, uh, like you yourself, you know, like you're like, Hey, I'm on tour. I see these guys. I know these guys are a great band. So you start to rely on that. And at, at some point you get too many connections away. Um, I mean, with bridge nine, we are still active where we, we still put out new records every year. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of really cool outside of the box opportunities in the post hard, you know, post half heart world, whether it was working with bands like Iron Sheik or Polar Bear Club or Backtrack, or, I mean, there, there was a, you know, War on Women. There's a, a ton of artists that we've worked with since um, that have done some very cool and exciting things. It is very difficult to keep that pace. You know, you can't put out 20 records a year uh, forever and have them be, not commodities, you know, have them be something that's pure and interesting to you. Um, so for me, it's, you know, we, we have scaled back there. Ha- it has been a conscious decision to say, all right, we can't put out that many records anymore. And I don't really want to, you know, it's a, it's, it is a huge, um, this, I mean, the number of moving parts that you have to have to have all that work is it's really difficult to continue and maintain um, for any period of time. So my feeling was, all right, let's let's do less new releases every year. So, you know, instead of doing 20, maybe let's do five, six, or seven a year. So we're still putting out something new. We're still creating. We're still challenging. Um, but also, we've built up this catalog. We've built up this history. Let's continue to release those things, you know, the, the, those, you know, uh, push those records. And, um, you know, that I think kind of helps us segue into what we're trying to do now where, you know, we're moving into our own, uh, store mm-hmm. and, and we're trying to put a face to the label now, because for many years we've existed in this, you know, for 14 years, we've been in an industrial complex that nobody could find if you gave them a map, mm-hmm. but now we're going to be on, on a main street. And we're going to be a place where people can come and and buy the new Bridge Nine release, but also buy the new Triple B release. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to still be a part of the equation. So, mm-hmm. you know, even if we don't have something new coming out every month, we can still be a part of the community. We can still be a place where people can, you know, allow us to be a part of the equation. I appreciate you talking about that because, like, it's kind of weird when you're getting a bit older and you're still pu- involved in punk and hardcore because, like, you know, like there's the generation that's doing it now. So for example, like let's say tri- triple B, like I don't, I don't know Sam, but like, you know, I, you look at that label and you're like, damn, like he's really built something. And it's cool 
that 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 person can have it now you know and it's just like like have heart was the band at the time they were the band at the time now it's like turnstiles the band at the time it's like you can't always hold the spotlight and i do love when like the older guard knows when just to recede into the background gracefully and that graceful kind of like hey i'm still here but like i'm not trying to fight for the spotlight you know i'm not trying to like stay I don't want to try and like keep other people out of the spotlight. Like this is triple B's time. That's sick. Like good for him. That's great. Full disclosure, Sam, mm-hmm. uh, who, who runs triple B mm-hmm. used to sell outside of family park. So mm-hmm. he's part of that generation yeah. and, uh, you know, um, didn't use the family park money necessarily as, uh, building his label, but he's been able to build something extremely cool. And, you know, like, I, I think it's, I was, I never, I don't know. I, I, did I compete with other labels? Absolutely. You know that you saw it firsthand. Um, but it wasn't, it, that's, I, I don't know. I never, that was not fun. You know, like mm-hmm. I never wanted to, you know, there's, there's more than enough to go around. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a matter, at least in this world that we exist in. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's just a matter of doing what we do, the way we do it to the best of our ability. And, you know, I'd rather collaborate with other people that are doing cool things and try and scheme or, you know, tear down their efforts. Yeah. It's interesting you say that though. Cause like you're a competitor, man, like I've known you for a long time and, and it's funny. Like I, I always say to, I used to always say to my friend, uh, Dave, Dave Larson, who, you know, it's like, Oh, I'm not competitive with other people. And he'd always roll his eyes. He's like, what is wrong with you? He's like, you're the most competitive person I've ever met. But the way that I always looked at competition in a negative light was like, I want to win so that you can lose. And that, that's not the way that I compete. The way that I compete is I want strong competitors about around me because they bring out the best in me. Cause it's like, Hey, if I go up to play a show, I want my set to be the best set that night. Like I want to blow every band off stage, not cause I'm trying to take something away from other people, but cause I'm trying to like raise my game to a certain level. And that's what I want with cadence. That's what I want in my everyday life is like, I thrive on competition and I know you, you're like, hev- like heavily a competitor. So Tell me about that perspective, man, because you're quite a competitive guy. You're competitive with Sully's for sure. And I guess there's what would be the difference between like kind of toxic competitiveness from your perspective versus competitiveness that brings up the best in you and other people. So I'm, I'm on the same page with you in terms of like you want competition, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want to just dominate your field necessarily because you, people, they rest on their laurels a little bit, you know, like you want to continue to push yourself and you want to continue to make something better. So you do need somebody kind of keeping you in check and, 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 but at the same time too, it's, you don't want to spend all of your energy um, going against them. You want to put all that energy moving yourself forward. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance. And for me, like I always try to, you know, find ways I I don't want to fight down and I don't want to fight behind me. I I want to focus on what's ahead. Um, So for me, uh, that's been a constant kind of struggle of trying to figure out how to, to focus my energy, but you're right. I mean, I am, I am competitive. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I'm competitive to a point where I want to push what I'm doing forward, but not necessarily at the detriment of others. I mean, there's mm-hmm. Sully's is a lot of competitors and I'm, I'm on a first name basis with many of them. And we, we, we have shared information in the past, um, you know, we've collaborated here and there where it's, where it's, you know, been beneficial for, for both of us. Like if we have like, you know, uh, like a common interest, um, I, I think that it's much better to keep lines of communication open, um, and, and have a mutual respect because it's tough at the end of the day, you know, your competitor is not that different from you, right? Mm-hmm. They might, they, 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 they have very similar interests. Mm-hmm. They have very similar passions. And it's tough because sometimes the person that you might get along with the best is, you know, on the other side of a competition. It's I, I learned I've learned over the years uh, to value uh, some of the people behind the scenes that I compete with more than, you know, just fighting over dollars. I'd rather be beat by someone that I like and respect rather than be beat by someone that I think sucks. Yeah, I agree. And- but also, people people that compete with you can also create opportunities for you. What you said about, I don't want to fight down. I don't want to fight back, like if fight backwards. I don't want to fight down. I don't want to fight backwards. I think it's like one of the most profound, like I've known you for a long time. That's like a real profound thing you just said, because like when I was saying earlier that like, 
not fighting to stay in the spotlight. Like you kind of know when to step out of the spotlight because the other people are fighting to take it. Let's say a triple B. It's like, listen, that guy's fighting to take it and deserves it and and has done really cool things. Just like you were doing really cool things before. And Death Wish, you know, is like they're in a different place because they're still like uh, really like putting out a ton of stuff right now. But that idea of like you took your energy and rather than trying to fight for the spotlight of where you were, you were taking that energy and putting it towards where you're going. And I think that's like a real profound thing. It's like not trying to like hold what you've done, but instead put that energy into what you're trying to do. Well, that's so if I was keeping the same pace, putting out the same number of records um, as I was five years ago, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm trying to do now. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, you know, if you've seen, by by constant Instagram story updates. It's mm-hmm. it's been, you know, for the last six months, I've been renovating a building that's going to become the new home for Bridge Nine at Sully's. Mm-hmm. And it is exhausting. It is uh so much more work than I've ever had to deal with, I think, on any level. But it's it's where I see the future of what I've been doing living. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I'm I, I'm just shifting my energy. Like I, you know, it's, I don't want to take away too much from, from this side, Mm -hmm. but I want to invest in the other side. And once the dust settles there, I'll, you know, I'll pick up and keep going. Yeah. And like that kind of toxic competitiveness, like I have been that in my life. Like, you know, when I was playing music, like kind of when I felt like I was like kind of losing my position in music, like what I'd done. Cause like, you know, a lot of people like you and me and people get into punk and hardcore. Cause like we have whatever situations in our lives that cause us to find like more something more alternative. But like when people, and I don't just mean in punk and hardcore, when people find that kind of first thing that make them successful and it starts to, the ground starts to change, you know, you've got like kind of the season and you've got like the spring and the summer, but eventually it turns to fall. When it turns to fall, you got a real choice. You can be like, okay, I need to prepare for next spring and next spring is taking me to somewhere else. Or you could kind of be like, no, I'm hunkering down and I'm going to hunker down here through the fall and the winter and I'm going to keep my spot. And that kind of toxic mindset of like keeping things and like fighting for what you had, like I've certainly, I've had, I've definitely been part of being toxically competitive before and like really learned some hard lessons from it. I think you, I think I don't want to speak for you, but I think you can relate to having been that and learn some lessons as well. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Oh, for sure. I mean, but you know, if, if you work really hard to to create something or to define something, and then if somebody else tries to kind of co-op it a little bit or mm-hmm. you know, kind of take what you've started and run with it, um, that you know, that can be difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, part of it you just need to recognize that you're that's your influence. You know, that that's mm-hmm. you creating something that is influencing other people. Um, you know, whether it's American Nightmare, I mean, you know, the, the number of bands that were influenced by American Nightmare, I mean, it's it's innumerable. There's so many people that took a piece of what they were doing and ran with it in their own way. And I think that, you know, thankfully, I, I think that's a good thing that that's happened to Bridge Nine. I think that it's shown that there's a lot of people that are doing stuff now, maybe at a higher level than we are, that saw what we were doing and and kind of took that ball and ran with it. 100%. All right. Well, you know, we're getting close to the end of our, of our interview. I do want to t- touch on something though, that I think is, it's pretty important. Um, let's talk about relationships. So, you know, I, I have such an interesting perspective on you now uh, in our relationship now, because, you know, growing up being in bands in the punk scene, you always kind of feel like you're being screwed over by your record label. And it's like so comical to me now. Right. Because like, you know, like, the story of punk bands are like, we got ripped off by our label. It's like, well, did you? And like, if you did by like, are we talking like $20? Are we talking like $200? Like the magnitude of what, of the way people speak about it versus what really happened is always so interesting. But also I've been a band. I've been a band on a label. I've been on your label. And I've also had a record label. I've been an employee who thinks they're getting screwed over by their boss. And then I've been a boss who like, someone's like, you screwed me over. So I've been on both sides of it in, in all the different ways now. And it's like maintaining relationships with people that you're working with, whether you're a boss or if you're a record label or whatever, it is hard. It's really hard. And very often leaders and the kind of people who are like heading up that thing are they're the ones that take the hits reputationally and they're the ones that lose the relationships where everyone else might be like, Oh, I'm still friends with so-and-so, but that so-and-so like really thinks poorly of you. You've had a lot of relationships. Like we were saying earlier, like a band can have through the life cycle of a band, they could have like 10 members. They could have 20 members. So, you know, a ton of people and 
you've clearly had some challenges around relationships. So how have you managed that as you've like, I guess, like, how have you managed and what have you learned about yourself through that process? So outside of being in a band, um, which I haven't been, I, you know, I've been in all those other scenarios. It's a difficult process because, you know, the same way I didn't want to take a paycheck from bridge nine because I didn't want to have it define my uh, relationship with what I was doing through money. Um, the, the hard part is when you start a label is you end up realizing that every relationship you have is defined on some level by your kind of the financial relationship. And with most bands, we're not talking much money at all, you know, so it's not that big of a deal um, either direction. You know, one of the hardest things that record labels and, and small businesses struggle with is, you know, uh, how everything flows and, you know, you don't start a, a label like Bridge Nine uh, to be an accountant. Mm-hmm. You know, like you, you do it because you love hardcore and punk and the community, and you want to do something positive. And you know, and for for many cases, it's a matter of you know, you a lot of times a label ends up you know taking the bath because you know they're putting out all this money to, to records that end up not going anywhere. Um, but it's it's a balancing act. It's trying to 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 figure out the best way to uh, maintain that relationship. And when, the, when something gets fucked up, you know, talking to those people, um, not everyone is always on the same page and not everyone's always rational about things, but more often than not, I think when you, when you're honest with somebody and you, you have a conversation that allows for you to, you know, to, to, to kind of keep things going. I mean, I know with, you know, we've had bands uh, work with us. We've had bands leave us. Um, members of those bands have come back and worked with us, you know, later on, on things. And, and, you know, I think that's usually a great sign when you've got this kind of relationship that continues over a period of say 20 years. Um, but you know, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a constant balancing act and, and do the best job for them as you can. So as we're closing off now, I'm going to ask you three questions. The first one is really hard and I'm not going to hold you to it. You can change your answer tomorrow. It does not matter. Like this is just in this moment, in this time, East coast, hardcore guy for you today in this moment, three most iconic new England hardcore bands of all time. New England hardcore bands. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, first I'm looking at Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I want to say my first band would be SSD control, Mm -hmm. but it's tough because like they, you know, never really did much to, to, to push their like influence on bands after they were a band. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of young up and coming hardcore kids that don't know SSD control that should, because they were the, for, they were a very foundational band. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Slapshot kind of took the ball at that time and ran with it mm-hmm. and and continues to this day. I mean, we're working with them on their next record, mm-hmm. you know, and this is, you know, 36 years after they started. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, SSD control and then moving on to Slapshot would be a good example. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Converge, I think, is a, is a huge one. Um, I don't count myself one of the, as a, as the biggest fan, mm-hmm. I've had some, some epic stage dives during Converge, but, and, it, you know, I've gotten to know them as people, but they, mm-hmm. you know, that you can't deny the influence that they've had, um, on so many sub sections of, of music. Um, uh, mm-hmm. so I think they're definitely in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I don't know, maybe American Nightmare, you know, mm-hmm. might be, you know, I know and there's a hundred other bands that should be in this conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just in terms of ones that are a de- degree of separation away from me and, mm-hmm. and people that I've either known or seen. Well, you kind of snuck four in there, but I'll, I'll allow it. SSD, Slapshot, Converge, and American Nightmare. Very respectable answers. It could change tomorrow. Who knows? But that's a good one. Sure. All right. Uh, next question. Um, if you're thinking about yourself and really what you've learned about you as a person, through the two businesses that you're, that you're running. What are you, what have you learned about yourself over the past 25 years that you probably wouldn't have known had you not taken on this journey? Uh, I've learned that I'm capable of a lot more than I ever thought I could be. 
Mm. You know, when you're in high school, um, you know, I think I was told at one point that I was afraid of success uh, because of whatever um, expectations that are placed upon you when you succeed. As I started to succeed in certain things um, and kind of build up this track record and build this pace, it, um, you know, it's enjoyable, you know, like I, you, you start to, I mean, if I jumped into the pace that I have now, when I was nine, 19 or 20, I would have had a heart attack and died right there on the spot. But, you know, I've been able to build up a tolerance um, that's allowed me to, I don't know, to, to, if I have an idea, I can just take the ball and run with it and create something and, and be excited about it. Uh, last question for you. You know, since you've been working on, on the space that you've been working on now, um, up into that point, you always kind of been more of a behind the scenes kind of guy. I don't see a lot of interviews with you, like podcasts with you, you know, like socially you're, I wouldn't say shy, but maybe like, you know, you're not the like life of the party kind of guy typically, but since you've been doing the, like you got this building and you've been building it up, you've been doing a lot of documentation about it. And it feels almost like you're like, kind of, you're putting yourself out there way more than I've seen you do. And like maybe ever, why is that? You know, I want, I feel like I'm on some crazy journey and I know it's, it's kind of cliche to say, but like, I, I want people to see it and I want people to go along with it and kind of see behind the curtain. You know, when I started bridge nine and early on, we had, um, we had a video, like a, like a, uh, like video camera, like in our space, in the office. And like, mm -hmm. this is like 2002, um, like a webcam that people could kind of look in. Cause you know, I didn't know a lot about the labels and the people that were behind the scenes and the labels that, um, I was a fan of growing up. So I wanted to have that. And we created, um, uh, like a blog system on our website early on. So people like our artists could, could contribute. Um, which I felt like at the time was kind of cutting edge. Um, I have done a handful of interviews and podcasts here, but I don't know, like I'm not, I'm not a, Hey, look at me guy a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that are really good at kind of drumming up attention about themselves. And, and I, I do some here and there, you know, and I, I'm great one-on-one -on -one with people mm -hmm. and, and can carry a conversation and, 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 you know, can have a, can have a good time, but I, I'm not, the guy that's like, Hey, come look at me, which is put, puts me at, at odds with considering myself a leader because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not the one that gets up in front of everyone and says, follow my lead mm -hmm. necessarily. You know, I, I, I start something and I, I, I surround myself with people that I think are interested in it. And I try to kind of, we kind of all kind of, it's like herding cats mm -hmm. kind of move mm -hmm. whatever direction we're trying to go in. Yeah. I mean, it's an uncomfortable thing for me to, to be in the spotlight sometimes. So, you know, it's, it's not something that I've, traditionally been good at, but, um, I do think that this move into the new building is crazy and, and the, the stuff that I've been having to do to deal with it, has been exceptional. So mm -hmm. I figured, you know what, I'm going to put it out there, let people know. So at least if somebody that, you know, I owe an email to, um, hasn't heard from me, they, at least they know that like, all right, maybe, maybe shit's a little crazy for him right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to get mad about it. Mm -hmm. um, on one level, but also, you know, people are emotionally invested in it. Bridge nine is, it's one thing to me, uh, and Sully's these are these as brands are, they, they have one meaning to me, but they have a very different, um, and oftentimes I'm learning, you know, very personal connection with other people, whether it's through the artists that we've worked with or the work ethic that I've kind of showcased and, and influence that people have kind of taken from, um, so it's been a matter of, of, I don't know, just letting people see what's happening and, and let them come along with it. I can, man. I, I think that's great. And I really like that idea. Like you know, leadership doesn't have to be like, you know, like planting the flag and being like, everybody look at me. It could just be doing something really cool, creating something that draws people in. And that's something that I think you've been very successful at is like people haven't rallied to you because you're the loudest vo voice in the room. You've just been the person who's been creating things that make people interested. And when people are interested, they want to get involved. And that de facto makes you a leader. And you've demonstrated that time and time again. Your businesses have had ups, they've had downs, but you've been consistent throughout all of it. And uh, I really appreciate appreciate that for, you know, what you've done for me, uh, personally and professionally, and then also what you've uh, done for our community. So thanks for that, man. Of course. I actually want to add to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people say when they want to, when they want to start their own business or their own initiative, um, they ask me what my thoughts are and like how to go about doing it. And my feeling has always been just start right now, drop whatever it is you're doing, 
don't wait until you have everything that you think you need to start. Because as you said, people want to rally around something and, you know, they can't rally around your idea, you know, if it doesn't exist in, in a physical form. So oftentimes it's just like, put something out there. I didn't put out, if I waited to put out my first record until I could afford full color printing and promotional posters and ads and every fan scene, I never would have started. And had I done it, maybe it would have taken four years and that whole window of time, nobody, there would have been, the momentum wouldn't have been growing, right? So for me, it's, I, when, when people ask, I just say, just start right away so you can put yourself out there and then your friends can rally around you and your idea and give it the momentum that it needs. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. I, I love that. So Chris, any last words as we're closing off? No, I mean, thank you for the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I thank you for uh, listening to my thoughts about leadership, even mm-hmm. though, again, I don't always consider myself a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's we're all trying to do whatever it is we can with whatever resources we have and make the most of it. Absolutely, man. All right, everyone. Um, I will see you in the outro and Chris, uh, you know, we look forward to the new space being open up. When is it going to be open? So we're going to be moving in there over the next couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the store that we're going to have in front of it mm-hmm. might not be open for a couple of months. There's mm-hmm. still a lot of work that has to go into it, but you know, follow, you can follow along on my, my Instagram. It's Chris B nine, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and just see kind of I'll, I'll update there as to right. when and where. So everyone check out Bridge Nine Records, check it, check out Chris's Instagram at Chris B9, and of course check out Sully's brand. We will look forward to the retail space being open sometime in 2022. And everyone else, I'll see you in the outro. Spencer, drop the beat. <laughs>